Okay. So today we're happy to have Dr. Tom Blight Hansen. Um, he's the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia, the Director of the Multi-Organ Transplant Program at BC Children's Hospital, and is the CDTRP Theme 5 lead. He gave a really great talk at this year's CDTRP meeting in Banff, and we look forward to hearing from you now. Awesome. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, it looks like there's probably, I don't know if everybody's, log, if anybody, everybody's registered in, because uh, it looks like there's only a couple of other people on the call. But um, I, I'm going to go ahead and, um, so thanks for that intro introduction. Um, this was a bit of a, a challenging topic, to be honest with you, because it wasn't, you know, very clearly well present on, you know, your, your research or present on, on, on a, a focused area. This is kind of a broad and diffuse thing. So I thought a lot about um, what uh, what might be of interest, and uh, what I think we'll do is we'll probably uh, I'll present for about a half an hour or so, and then I'd like to leave uh, it open for some some Q and A uh, at the end of the the webinar, um, so that I can get some some thoughts from you. Um, just to give you um, there we go. Just to give you a bit of a scope of what um, what I was planning to cover in the webinar. Uh, first is to just give you a bit of a sense of the scope and scale of uh, pediatric transplant research uh, in general, um, and where that fits in the in the larger spectrum of uh, of research. Um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the nuances that are specific to uh, doing research in children. Uh, talk a little bit also about the successes that we've had in Canada about uh, with, with pediatric transplant research. And then to spend a little bit of time at the end talking about um, how we maybe can and should be doing research differently to address the, the needs of, uh, of children and, and in particular the needs of our uh, patients with solid organ transplants. And I'm going to try to make this generic to all solid organ transplantation rather than just focused on kidney transplant, which is my primary specialty. Um, so I know you guys are all on mute, but this is meant to uh, have you first for a very brief second think a little bit about what you feel are uh, the big pediatric transplant issues in 2019. And maybe what I'll ask you to do is just while we're, we're uh, uh, while I'm presenting some of this, uh, maybe if you can either use the the, the chat uh, or even the, the Q&A panel, maybe just use the Q&A panel. If you've got some big questions that you think um, we should be addressing in terms of what type of research we should be doing now, um, I'd be really interested to hear uh, some of what your thoughts are. Um, and uh, so go ahead and, and write some of those in as you're thinking about them. Um, I'm expecting at least uh, four, uh, one from each of the people on the call. Um, so I did a little, just to sort of get a bit of a snapshot of where we're at, I did uh, a PubMed search to look for uh, pediatric uh, transplant research uh, that's been done and published. And this is looking at the last five years. And we, I, I did this using search terms like kidney transplant, heart transplant, liver transplant, et cetera, and then I just filtered them uh, based on uh, whether they uh, were including pediatric uh, patients or not. And so you can see there's a lot of research that gets published, you know, over 6,000 papers in uh, 2019, and the general trend for all transplant research has been to have progressively increasing uh, uh, publications, which reflects the amount of work that's being done in the field. Uh, maybe disappointingly is that if you look at the bottom of the panel, the orange, um, the orange studies are the ones that are being done uh, that that are meant to be including uh, pediatric patients in some way, shape, or another. And you can see that those are those are uh, probably less than uh, they're, they're certainly less than a sixth of the total number of publications. And the number of those publications is actually fairly stagnant. And if we look at that in just a little bit more detail. I tried to look at uh, not just randomized control trials, but any clinical trials, uh, studies that were listed as clinical trials as part of their description. And you can see that the vast majority of these publications are actually not uh, clinical trials, which is what we would consider to be a higher bar of evidence in terms of clinical application. And in fact, in 2019, there were only seven uh, clinical trials that had been uh, reported in all of the world literature in pediatric uh, transplantation. And if you look at those seven 
pediatric clinical trials, actually three of them weren't actually pediatric. So the, the first two studies that are listed here actually were adult studies, and, and somewhere in the paper they must have mentioned children, but uh, they weren't specifically included. And even in the third study, this is mostly an adult cohort, but at least they, at least they included uh, pediatric recipients, which is part of what we're really talking about here is that larger studies can be done with, with the inclusion um, of uh, pediatric patients unless there's a reason to exclude them. Um, so if you then look at the remaining uh, pediatric clinical trials, you can see that uh, actually one of those was actually a pre-transplant study and really in my mind, at least in terms of outcomes-based research, wouldn't qualify as a, as a, a pediatric transplant study. Um, two of these were cohort studies. Now one of them was a multi-center cohort study, so it was a single arm interventional type of study, um, but there was no control group. Um, and one of the strengths of that is at least it included multiple centers. The only uh, randomized clinical trial, um, and I use that in quotation marks, had 21 patients in it. So hard to make any, uh, any inferences, and in particular in this study, the, the, the uh, conclusion was a, a lack of effect of blood pressure control in terms of longer term outcomes. And uh, that is very definitely not sufficiently powered to uh, demonstrate conclusively a lack of effect of, of anything, um, uh, let alone something like blood pressure control, which would take several years to accrue. Um, so really when you think about it, there's not a lot of studies that have been, uh, that are actively being published. The ones that are being published are very low in terms of their N, and, um, and very few of them are at the highest level of quality, which would be uh, randomized controlled trials. So um, the reflection back to, to you all is, are these really the most important questions that we need to answer in pediatric transplantation? And uh, to the extent that they might be, and there might be more important questions, how might we answer those questions better? So let's think about what's unique about pediatric solid organ transplantation. So um, in Canada, at least, um, there's 50 to 60 kidney transplants and, and about roughly the same number of heart and liver transplants that are done across the country on an annual basis. So even if you include all solid organ transplants, there's not uh, really a lot of them on an annual basis. Um, they differ from adults uh, more than just in their numbers. The primary diagnosis of end-stage organ failure is, is uh, very definitely very different from what you would see in an adult cohort. So in that, to that extent, they are actually very different from, um, from uh, patients who would be seen in an adult clinic. They also have a different and, and usually many fewer comorbidities. And from the standpoint of a population that can be studied, strictly speaking, say to look at alloimmune events, they actually lack some of the comorbidities that confound analysis of graft survival and, and graft outcome. There are also higher immunological risk. And so this is a population that, you know, uh, on a per enrollment basis, you're much likely, more likely to have uh, immune events that could be captured and studied efficiently. Um, of course, there's also the developmental aspects, which raises uh, a number of other different types of questions in terms of what, what we define as success after transplantation. Uh, and the, these include uh, things like you know, physical and emotional and uh, sexual development. They speak to issues of adherence and also developmental aspects of alloimmunity. And then finally, there's a whole uh, psychosocial context to uh, pediatric transplantation. Uh, which speaks to the need to evaluate the success of transplantation in the context of how, the impacts not only on the person and their quality of life, but also impacts on family and their care community. Um, you've probably all heard often the expression, children are not small adults, and we often do this when we are um, critiquing adult studies that seek to potentially extend their findings into pediatric populations. Um, but I think we have to think of this as a mantra for inclusion rather than exclusion, which is to say we need to consider the differences of uh, children uh, uh, as it relates to transplantation and outcomes in the context of how those changes might be different from adults and rather to make sure that we account for those differences and study those differences rather than simply ignore those differences or relegate them to another 
uh, type of uh, population. There's an ethical aspect to doing uh, research in children that 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 obviously needs to be considered, um, and you know, in all senses, this is a vulnerable population um, that uh, deserves a a a, uh, a recognition in terms of their need for protection. Um, one of the issues, uh, as well, is the capacity for fully informed consent, um, and that consent is always a combination of assent and uh, consent by a, uh, a, a person who can speak on behalf of the, re of, of the recipient. Um, one of the critical pieces in pediatric research is that there's a requirement for an acceptability of research risk, and that is that um, in, with the exception of uh, very low risk studies, um, almost universally there needs to be a potential benefit to health um, for the recipient uh, for participation in research. Not a guarantee of benefit, but the potential for benefit. Um, this is a paper that was uh, published in the EU. It was a, it was a pretty good review of uh, ethical aspects uh, of clinical research in, in minors, not specific to transplantation. Um, one of the aspects is that it went over in a fair amount of detail the uh, legal requirements, and these are, of course, European regulations. But I'll make a note that it, it is mandatory to include now in Europe uh, pediatric populations when new drugs are being developed, if not uh, at an efficacy uh, level, at least at a safety level to ensure that these drugs that are, that are being patented can be also used in pediatric uh, populations. It also these things also highlight again why pediatrics has been thought of as a cross-cutting theme in the CDTRP, uh, because these are these are aspects that need to be considered when we're designing uh, projects uh, that may not first and foremost be directed towards inclusion of children. Uh, another source of information on the ethical approach to pediatric research is the Canadian uh, Pediatric Society, and this is an excerpt from the, um, uh, from the uh, CPS position statement that was most recently reaffirmed in 2018. And it really just breaks down some of the, 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 the usual ethical principles that we use when we consider um, a, an issue such as this. Uh, and, and the issue of beneficence we talked about previously in terms of the ability to apply evidence-based care uh, and, and potentially the, the, the opportunity to benefit from participation in research. Um, in terms of which studies might be excluded in uh, children, we think about uh, avoiding potential harmful therapies. Um, and this is one of the cases where usually we will wait for some of these therapies to be first reported, at least in a phase uh, two uh, level type of study, to ensure that the potential toxicities are well understood and that we can avoid harm in children um, uh, unnecessarily. Um, but it also stresses the issue of distributed justice, which allow, which really sort of speaks to the need to ensure that children can benefit from research as much as adult populations, and they can't if we don't do research in children. The issue of informed consent that we talked about before, and, and as usual, the issues of protecting confidentiality within the limits of legal requirements, and that also speaks to the fact that you know children aren't really able to. Um, uh, have agency over their decision making and their data until they turn 18 and to consider how those data might be uh, might need to be uh, uh, reaffirmed for example the, the need for ongoing consent and reconsenting when patients reach the age of majority um, and these are some uh, guidelines that help to guide people like me in terms of how to conduct research ethically in children uh, and it includes the need uh, for us to be uh, advocating for research to actually be conducted in children, um, that we need to be aware of our obligations under uh, tri-council policies uh, for, for ethics, um, that we need to be aware of the need to promote uh, and recognize uh, autonomous decision-making capacity. And that actually means including children in the discussions of consent and assent uh, for for research um, as part of their actual development uh, and to recognize that that's an important thing for them to participate in, to be aware of our own conflicts of interest as it relates to industry funding, um, and to be participants at an international level to advocate for um, supporting research in socially vulnerable populations. <clears throat> 
So this is something that I've heard before and, and sort of speaks to maybe well why, why some, uh, some studies don't start off including kids. Uh, I've, I've heard it said to me that including kids is a pain in the ass. And that's an unfortunate statement, but it does reflect the fact that there are, there are logistical and practical barriers to including kids in studies. And, and our job as pediatricians and, uh, and, and pediatric researchers is to try to help our uh, adult colleagues and other colleagues to move past some of these barriers in a constructive way. Certainly, the, there's a protectionist attitude in some individuals, and, and that's not a bad thing. It just means that people are inclined to shelter children from potential harm, and if they view participation in research as a potential harm, then that may be viewed as a reason not to do research, and hopefully for the reasons I just discussed, uh, we probably ought to be thinking about it in the other way. But there's also additional regulatory requirements. There's additional consent processes, assent processes. There's often protocol adaptations that need to be made in order to permit uh, dosing uh, uh, and, and conduct of clinical research in children. Um, it, it's also difficult to recruit adequate numbers of children to power, for example, an arm of the study that might seek to look at age as a, uh, as a criterion uh, upon which to um, do an analysis. And, and, and finally, there's financial disincentives, especially for uh, treatments that may be more targeted at children. Uh, and often we need to go into the rare diseases category um, for funding uh, and orphan drug uh, types of funding models that, that unfortunately result in, uh, do result in research being done, but also result in medications uh, being extraordinarily expensive when they do come to market. So just because it's hard to do, it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do to include children in research. And our job as pediatric researchers is to make it as easy as possible uh, for, uh, to, to work with uh, collaborators to, to make sure that that happens. So I'm going to talk a little bit more, a, a little bit about conducting uh, pediatric research in Canada, focusing on capacity and also structural deficits. Um, so one of the, in terms of capacity, you can think of this in a few different areas. You know, one of the reasons that probably more research isn't being done in Canada is that there's not very many of us actually doing uh, pediatric research as principal investigators. And it speaks to a lot of issues, you know, one of them being that we work in academic environments that aren't actually really set up to support clinician investigators. And what I mean by that is people who spend half their time in the clinic and half their time doing research. It's a bit better for clinician scientists who spend 80% more of their time. Um, it's also not set up to protect time for allied health researchers. And, and many of the areas that we would like to study in pediatric transplantation really have to do with psychosocial and dietary and nutritional and physical outcomes that really would benefit from having our allied health partners involved. There is, however, very strong community support. We are a small community, and we know, we know each other in the, in the Canadian context and also internationally. Um, and uh, we enjoy working together and have worked together very well in the past. And so the, that basic infrastructure, at least in terms of willingness, is there. Um, and then the last issue is just the capacity in terms of the number of patients that we have. So we have to be very careful not to oversubscribe to different research projects, given that it's going to be the same uh, patients who are um, participating in the same studies. And, and to come up with strategies to, for example, enroll patients in registries that can serve as consent for participation in other future cohort-based studies so that you don't have to keep on going back to the same patients for consent. Um, the infrastructure, infrastructure deficit is also very real. So there's, for example, there's no readily accessible national registry that we can utilize easily in research. Um, the core Kai High registry uh, does exist, but there are many centers that actually don't submit data to that registry. Um, biobanking is important, but inconsistent and really dependent on the site. Um, and, but there, is, there are opportunities for better integration, and that's one of the, one of the projects that CDTRP is working on. There's also a lack of economies of scale. So when we, when we have studies that include only, you know, say five or ten patients from each center, we don't necessarily all have research assistants and research teams that we can plug into for the 0.1 or fraction of a position that might be needed to support doing some study visits for a short period of time. And, and that really creates challenges in terms of being able to include as many children as possible for meaningful research, which is really what we need to do if we're going to do it in Canada. 
and you know, finding meaning, meaningful outcomes in outcomes-oriented research is expensive um, uh, because these are often outcomes that happen five or even ten years down the road. And funding studies that that allow for long enough follow-up in the absence of uh, surrogate outcomes uh, can be really difficult. So. One of the implications of this is that the research environment, unfortunately, tends to favor uh, low-impact, single-center studies over uh, what we might consider more trans transformational, uh, transformational types of research, which really require multi-center design and, and bigger, bigger levels of funding. So I'm just going to mention briefly um, some successes in the face of adversity. So these are five studies that, that uh, that uh, I've been involved with in one way or another, and apologies to other uh, uh, studies that have been done out there, but these are, I think are good examples of some of the reasons that studies can succeed. So the positive study you may uh, be aware of was uh, funded by through the CNTRP, and it had aims to do with looking at drug dosing, looking at um, age-related immune responses, looking at systemic effects on drug adherence, and the reason it was successful is firstly it was leveraging some pre-existing infrastructure at uh, SickKids um, and their DNA biobank. It was cross-cutting and interdisciplinary, so it included all organs and, and not all, but most of the big pediatric centers in Canada. And it also actually targeted young adults uh, as well as pediatric age populations, and that allowed us to expand a little bit the, the, the denominator in terms of the number of uh, kids who could potentially be enrolled. Uh, one of the studies that that uh, that I've been doing that's uh, nearing completion was a biomarker study, and we were able to recruit every pediatric center in the country, so optimize at least the capacity for enrollment. And we had a very open tent philosophy, so that we're we're trying to conduct the analysis so that it really gives the option for all of the investigators uh, at any of the sites to be participants, and as well as fellows and other trainees who might want to use the data. For, uh, for reasons other than the primary objectives of the study. Uh, a third study that has NIH funding is one by that Beth Foster has been, been leading uh, out of Montreal, and that's, uh, that's an intervention on adherence. Um, and that was leveraging U.S. partnerships, so one of the ways to increase our end is also to include centers from the United States and to, to build those partnerships so that we can answer important questions uh, together. And this is a randomized uh, clinical trial that demonstrated that uh, a pill box and coaching intervention increases and improves adherence to immunosuppressive drugs. Um, and uh, another study that has just more recently started, but which is ongoing, is a, a, f a study funded, and this is a targeted RFA looking at pediatric research. Um, and and uh, this study was looking at uh, uh, validating biomarkers that had previously been um, uh, studied in adult populations to, to see whether they are also valid in pediatric populations. And, and the strength here was, was actually the, the targeted funding mechanism, and sometimes there will be funding available for these types of very specific uh, and focused uh, endeavors. Um, unfortunately, in BC, we're the only site that was participating in this study, and there's, but there's multiple U.S. partners, and it's one of those collaborations that I'm hoping that we'll be able to build on as a transplant community going forward uh, to, to be more inclusive of other Canadian sites. And then finally, this is a, this is a, a study that Samantha Anthony has been leading out of, uh, out of uh, Sick Kids in Toronto, um, and it's, uh, there's both local and national funding uh, for the study, and it's with the goal of uh, developing uh, electronic patient-reported outcome monitoring in pediatric transplant patients, and really speaks to some of the more qualitative research that we can and should be able to do across all of our sites in Canada. Um, I'll mention these quickly um, since uh, I'm cognizant of the time as well. But the other, uh, the other major resource that we have is beyond our Canadian data sets is to look at international data sets. And important in that is that in order to in order to use data from international data sets, we need to contribute data to international data sets. So there's three listed here. Uh, NAPRATIX is a pediatric North American registry. Uh, SPLIT is the, the, the liver transplant registry. Uh, and the pediatric heart study is a, is a cardiac registry. And all of these have the advantage of collecting a, a, uh, a, uh, a comprehensive data set on transplant recipients from the time of transplantation um, and providing that really long-term data um, that helps us to guide our outcomes-based research. Um, 
I'm going to skip over the um, the the, ne the other two, other than to say that I've included on these slides the the websites for these different uh, registries. Uh, all of these have been present since the the, the 1990s. So the Napratix has over 21,000 patients in it. The, the split registry uh, has over 3,000 patients in it and is, is organized uh, out of the NIH. Um, and the pediatric heart transplant study has also been around since 1993. And all of these have provide opportunities for benchmarking from a quality improvement perspective, the opportunity for registry-based cohort types of analyses, and in some cases, such as in Napratix and also in the pediatric heart study, the potential opportunity to design studies using the database and to leverage the database infrastructure for prospective types of studies. Um, there are now ongoing uh, several other studies that are sponsored under the CDTRP, um, and these are just examples of studies that have benefited from smaller grant funding that hopefully will be able to evolve into larger studies. Um, so there's a couple of studies out of, uh, out of Montreal looking at sex and the impact of sex hormones on immune profiles, um, where there's a lot of work being done looking at PTLD and EBV. Uh, so there's some other biomarker work that we're doing here in Vancouver. Um, there's another study that's looking at uh, the introduction of varicellin immunization in children with transplants. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of other locally funded studies like this that are trying to develop sufficient pilot data to leverage into more national funding. So I'm going to end with some thoughts on how we might be able to accomplish meaningful uh, transplant research in Canada. Uh, I think one of the things that we need to try to do is to think a little bit bigger. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, single center studies, even the biggest of our centers in Canada, can only um, answer questions with a limited impact and if we would be able to combine those data with data from other similarly larger centers in the country, we can just say a whole lot more with the data that we have and we can avoid some of what happens in single center studies, which is that you're actually measuring practice at an individual center rather than necessarily the phenomenon of the disease that we're trying to research. Um, I think there is some work that needs to be done on building um, research priorities. Um, uh, what are the research priorities that we have in Canada? There has been some work involving uh, patient uh, groups that have uh, tried to develop this on a macro level. I'm not sure that we've actually done this from the standpoint of pediatric research, and maybe that's something that we need to answer more specifically because I suspect the answers would be different in terms of what our patients perceive as important. Um, we already operate on a big tent type of philosophy, uh, so we try to bring more people in to, to the endeavor, um, and, and that also speaks to looking for international partners. Um, I, I think one of the deficits is the number of investigators that we have, and, and part of the reason for trying to have a big tent is to try to get more people interested in studying uh, children who are living with uh, organ transplants. Um, and if we can get those people interested and, and help them to recognize that nobody's doing work in this area and they could devote an entire career to um, helping to understand and improve the lives of children living with transplants, I think we would do a great service to, to, to our patients and to the research endeavor in general. Um, developing that includes developing the next generation of researchers as well, and, and this is where we need to focus our attention on our uh, our uh, trainees, uh, both our, our um, graduate student trainees uh, as well as our clinical trainees, and try to support people to develop careers that have a focus in transplantation research as well as uh, clinical transplantation. Some programs that help with this are, the, are among other things, the CDTRP trainee program, uh, but also to help our trainees to gain access, for example, to some of those international data sets and registries, um, um, to also try to access data from completed research studies. So the, you know, if you look at the positive study, for example, there's a huge amount of data that was generated from that study uh, only a small fraction of that has actually been been researched, 
and we need to be making sure that if somebody's got a question that they might want to answer, that we actually go to those go to those data sets to see if we can mine those data sets for additional uh, data. Uh, it's a lot easier to do that than it is to uh, set up, fund, and run a prospective study for five or ten years to collect the data after the fact. Um, and I guess one final thing that I would talk about is just the opportunity to engage with our clinical programs. And because so much of the research that we think about in pediatrics really has a clinical uh, type of angle to it, uh, we really need to be able to um, address the study fatigue that happens with patients who might be, um, might be asked to be part of multiple different studies, but also to be conscious of the fatigue of site investigators who are good research citizens, great research citizens, I would say, um, and recognize the major role that they play, but also to respect their time, and, and that has to do with how we perhaps organize uh, the, the conduct of different studies and try to make it as easy as possible for sites to be a participant. Um, that includes things like centralizing some supports, uh, research ethics applications, data safety monitoring boards, how data gets entered uh, from data collection. All of those things can be done in such a way that they take some of the pressure off the participating sites. I think also funding is, is critical, and, and we tend to, uh, sometimes sites will get a little bit short-changed um, when it comes to the allocation for the work that they're actually doing at the site. And I think it's an area where we really mustn't be uh, we, we must be comprehensive, especially considering what I said before about the lack of research infrastructure in some of those some of those studies. I think we also have to think about virtuous study designs, and and that has uh, that speaks to the need to build in some direct benefits to both the clinicians at sites and participants. Um, often that means feeding them back the data that we're collecting in a pseudo real time, so that they can understand what participation in those studies means uh, for patients uh, as well as for um, the programs. And, and certainly if there's data that's being collected in one area or one study or one registry, to find ways to leverage that so we don't ask centers to put in the data two and three different times for the same patients. Um, we need to address some of the infrastructure uh, deficit and that uh, Part of that means actually looking to develop and validate surrogate outcomes that can, inter that can be used to expedite interventional types of trials. We can't look at graph survival realistically as an endpoint because uh, any intervention that you do is going to take 5, 10, or even 15 years to come to fruition. That's different, for example, if you're trying to set up a new ex vivo system, you can set up the system, put the graft uh, on the ex vivo machine, um, do your analyses, and you know, two weeks after transplant, you can have endpoints that are relevant to assessing the utility of that system. We often have to wait five or 10 years for those outcomes. So having good surrogate outcomes is really critical. Um, uh, we need to incorporate patient reported outcomes, that's what PRO is, as well as think about how to engage patients. Um, we need to foster and support biobanking because those are often excellent ways to answer uh, questions about the biological basis for some of the changes that we're seeing. Um, we do need a durable infrastructure for to, to support registry-based types of uh, studies, including registry-based clinical trial designs, and also to try to consider more uh, innovative, uh, adaptive designs of clinical trials that can help us to identify which patients are really at the highest risk and to target those high-risk patients with specific interventions. 